there's been a lot of focus lately on the move in North America away from the CCS Type 1 charging standard that has, to date, been the charging connector of choice for the majority of electric car models being made and sold for that market, to the NAX connector, aka the North American Charging Standard, or Tesla Supercharger Inlet. We have made plenty of videos on this channel about that transition, covering the automakers, charging station manufacturers and charging networks who've signed on. We've detailed how this won't be an overnight switch, and we've even discussed some of the perils that lay ahead. Yet the transition to NAX from CCS Type 1 isn't, despite what many of our colleagues in the EV world and fans maintain, a magic spell to fix the world's charging networks. While we'd all be millionaires if we received 10 bucks for everyone who had told us that NAX will solve the challenges of public charging for EVs forever, and yes, there are some technical challenges that will be made better or eliminated with a switch to NAX, the reality is very different. But the rest of the challenges that currently face the electric car charging industry they'll still be there because electric car fast charging is broken and a connector won't change that. Let's go there. I'm not going to delve into the history books of EV charging networks in this video. We've done that plenty on this channel in the last few months and we'll try and throw some links into the description for you to go and peruse at your leisure. Instead, I want to focus on some of the biggest issues facing the EV charging industry right now, specifically fast charging industry, and let you know which ones NAX will fit and which ones they won't. I'll also give you some ideas as to how the ones that won't be fixed by NAX might possibly be fixed in the future. So let's start with the easy one. The CCS Type 1 connector as currently used by most non-Tesla brands in North America. It's large. It's unwieldy. The associated cable is also pretty hefty in size. And if you're someone who uses a mobility aid to move around, the sheer size of the connector can be a lot to handle, especially in charging locations with limited space around the vehicle. EA, I am looking at you and your very stupidly placed metal bollards. Even if you are someone who doesn't need to put both hands on the CCS connector to remove it from its holster and put it in your vehicle, it's very often still a two-handed job to get the charge cable where you want it, especially on newer, higher power charging stations with thick, water-cooled cables. Of course, Tesla's NAX connector is substantially smaller and the cables that are currently at supercharger sites are pretty darn short. This helps reduce weight and take more of the strain of the cable and connector off the person plugging in. However, Tesla's charging cables are currently nice and short because Tesla puts its charging sockets in the same place on every single vehicle. And in order to accommodate other vehicles from other manufacturers, that will need to change at Tesla supercharger sites in the future. Similarly, companies that want to offer NACs and appeal to more vehicles than just Teslas will need to make those charging cables far longer to accommodate the diverse charging port locations we have in the EV industry today. And that, of course, will make the cables heavier, unless someone gets creative with strain relief, something we've already started to see on some enterprising CCS Type 1 charging stations. While Tesla's connector will make the physicality of plugging in more easy, the jury is out on the required cabling. The next big issue with charging stations, though, is, of course, reliability. And Tesla has an incredibly high reliability for its charging stations because it designed, built and operates them. It has good parts inventory and superchargers use basically the same power electronics for charging as Tesla uses in its vehicles. It just puts many of those chargers in parallel to increase the total charge current. That keeps costs low for Tesla, but it also means that when a charging unit inside a supercharger fails, the system can power down the affected stage and then continue to use the other chargers in parallel within the system. The unit still works, 
it just works at a reduced maximum charge rate relative to how many charging stages are not operating. While some charging manufacturers outside Tesla use exactly the same design philosophy and can derate their charging circuits in a similar way to allow them to continue to work if something goes wrong, it is worth noting that unless I'm very much mistaken, and please, please tell me in the comments if I'm wrong, there aren't any charging networks that I can think of which operate fast charging stations they designed and built in-house. This means that when things go wrong, those networks then have to work with station manufacturers, often in other parts of the world, to diagnose and fix the problem. Worse still, as I recalled in another video on this channel recently, if the repair and service technicians for a given charging network are either not properly trained or properly furnished with enough replacement parts to make expeditious repairs, charging stations and the people who use them suffer. Of course, some people would say that's just a sign of the superiority of Tesla's superchargers. But it would be fairer to say that Tesla's low downtime is down to the design of the charging stations combined with proper management of the repair process. And while it's a bit of an urban myth that Tesla superchargers don't ever go wrong, that's definitely not true, Tesla is better at dealing with repairs as and when they're needed. Oh, and I want to throw something else in here because it's important. Because Tesla owns the network and the cars, if there is a strange problem with charging, it's a relatively simple matter to pull the logs for both the charging station and the car. Additionally, it's often the case that the car reports a problem back to Tesla, who can then reach out to the charging station remotely in order to start the diagnostic process. Usually when another charging station goes wrong that isn't part of a supercharger network, there's a lot more coordination needed between the charging station operator, the charging station manufacturer, and often the automobile manufacturer to figure out just what on earth went wrong and why the charging session failed. It's one of the reasons why it seems to take so long to get to the bottom of compatibility issues when a new car launches that for some reason can't charge at certain charging stations despite following the prescribed standard. I think it would be lovely to dream that Nax will solve all of this. But it won't. Nax is after all going to be using the CCS communication protocols for the most part, and until it's easy for automakers and charging station companies to sync up error logs to get to the bottom of issues, there will still be logistics to take care of. For true, impactful change, we're going to need to not only see a standardization of the charging connector, but also a far more comprehensive standard for reporting errors and integrating cross-network reporting between different charging stations, charging station manufacturers and automakers. Right now, because of the different charging station manufacturers that exist around the world and the different amounts of data transparency that they are happy with or are legally obliged to provide, this is not happening yet. And I'm not even going to go into the hoops that will need to be jumped through in order to anonymize the data so that people's personal details aren't being shared across multiple networks, but enough identifying features are being shared so that it becomes easier to identify if a particular car is having problems with a particular type of charging station, or if it's just a blanket thing that every single charging station has a problem. Next, as the lovely Christy Allsop says, location, location, location. Fast charging requires a lot of power and a significant amount of groundwork to be carried out before charging stations can be installed. This means you're more likely to see a large batch of fast charging stations at shopping malls and big box stores than you would in independent locations. And that means very often that large corporate entities sign agreements with charging providers to put charging stations at a given number of their locations across a region where overheads for installing those charging stations will be as low as possible. To put it bluntly, you often see charging stations located in places where there's apathy at best towards EVs and sometimes outright hostility at worst 
I found charging stations with sausages crammed up into the connector. I found charging stations with cut cables or vandalised screens. And I've opted not to use charging stations that smelled more like a bloke's urinal than a charging station. Yet yeah, that is the curse of being trans femme and a super taster. I remember the smell of urinal cakes, even though I've not been in a gent's bathroom for coming up on 25 years. Side notes aside, if we're going to see charging networks become more reliable, we need more appropriate placement for charging stations because Tesla is a premium brand and it tends towards charging locations that are more upmarket, you're less likely to encounter a Tesla supercharger hidden away behind some dumpsters at the back of a shopping mall. Again, changing the plug type won't solve that particular problem. Nor, unfortunately, will accessibility. Some charging networks, Electrify America is by far the worst offender in my opinion, have terrible charging station layout when it comes to people who need to use mobility aids or need extra space to get in and out of their vehicle. Not only that, but many charging stations, they seem to have been designed by people who think that every electric car is a gee whiz or maybe a twizzy meaning that anything larger than a Nissan Leaf is going to have a difficulty getting into a space and plugging in. Yes, a Nax connector may be easier to physically handle and put into your vehicle, assuming the cable is long enough, but some of the public charging station designs in use around the world are simply not fit for purpose, or in fact, accessible. These issues need to be addressed before we have a fixed public charging network. Before I leave the citing portion, we also need to acknowledge that every charging network, including Tesla, prioritizes everything else above equitable charging station access. This includes placing charging stations in safe spaces that everybody within a community can easily use if they need to. Kate's actually working on an epic video on equity in charging, so I'm not going to dwell on that much here. But it also means that charging networks need to make sure that stations aren't hidden behind barriers of some sort. I want you to think about visiting a gas station, a filling station. You pull up, you pay, you pump, or maybe someone pumps for you if you're in New Jersey. The point is that you don't usually have to go through a barrier to get into the gas station. But in many large cities around the world, that is exactly what you have to do to get a charge. I visited Tesla supercharger sites in Los Angeles where you have to pay for parking in order to charge. I've visited parking garages where charging stations are hidden in an obscure place that charges $10 an hour to park after you've gone past the barrier and you have to pay for each hour or part thereof. Putting public charging behind physical barriers that you have to pay extra money to get past not only adds fees to the process of charging, but it makes it far harder for people to want to switch because gas stations don't do that. And in the world of 24 hour filling stations, we really also need to get away with fast charging sites that are not available 24 seven. When I used to live in Bristol, UK and my mum, still lives in Norwich and I would go and visit her, I had to plan my trip through Norfolk in my Nissan Leaf so that when I went past one particular charging station in Swaffham, I did so before it was closed for the night or I wouldn't finish my trip. Again, things have changed a lot since then, but that wasn't a connector issue. It was a charging network placement issue. One that all networks, unfortunately, suffer to some degree or other. Finally, we need better education into fast charging etiquette. In the last year, I've heard of multiple fisty cuffs at charging stations over who gets to charge next. And this year, there was sadly even a fatality overcharging at a Tesla supercharger site. Some of this, of course, is born out of people being people and being selfish. But I would wager that a lot of it is down to the way in which there is a disconnect between charging stations, automakers, and consumers. Few new car owners are familiar with basic charging etiquette if they're first time EV owners. Things like moving on when you reach 80% full, 
And even fewer first-time EV owners understand that not all vehicles and charging stations are capable of the same levels of power transfer, even if they have the same physical connector. Every automaker and every charging station operator needs to better communicate the basics to their respective customers. And again, we haven't actually seen much of that with Tesla because while, yes, there are older Teslas on the road which charge far more slowly than the current new hotness, there's generally a pretty similar charging experience across the board for all Teslas since the S, and Tesla does a much better job of communicating actual charge speeds to customers inside the car, not to mention a route planner that tells you how long you're going to be there and when you can move off again. As part of all of this, we need automakers to also stop giving away free charging. Frankly, I've lost track of the number of times in the past year I've rocked up to a charging station to see a Volkswagen ID4 or some other brand new EV that's been sat at a fast charging station for well over an hour, sometimes two, because the owner was told by the dealership their cars came with free charging and by Jove they're going to use it and get a full charge too. Not so long ago, it was less of an issue, but the number of EVs hitting the road are growing far faster than the number of charging stations being deployed. So in closing, while I'm sure that there are plenty of people yelling at the screen right now and saying that if we just let Tesla be the only charging network, all would be solved, perhaps there are some more extreme folks saying that we just need all automakers to die off and for Tesla to be the one true king. And yeah, to be fair, you might have a point. The history books are full of examples of companies and products who absolutely trans the competition through market dominance and superiority. Companies whose names are now synonyms for the things that they were designed to do. There's a reason we say Hoover instead of vacuum cleaner, grab a Band-Aid in North America instead of an adhesive bandage, or indeed go to the ice rink to watch an ice hockey game and the Zamboni finishing the ice instead of calling it an ice resurfacer. But here's the tough thing. We're kind of out of time for that. We need to transition to clean agreement forms of transportation. We needed to do that yesterday, the day before, or about 20 years ago. And for us to make that switch today, we mean all automakers, all charging station manufacturers working together and solving the mess that many of them, helped by us, got everybody into. As long as it's properly standardised and everything is set out correctly, NEX will be the first part of that cooperative future to a better fast charging. But all of that other stuff I've listed in this video, frankly, that won't be solved by a connector. That's down to us to fix. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note below. You can reach out in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you are a Patreon supporter, in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Kofi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. And don't forget, we're now on Peertube too. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing Charged Up supporters and shout outs go out to our V2G Patreon supporters. They are Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C. Hey Esker, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Raging Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Framgen, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Asentar, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlarl, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder and Paul Nelson. And finally, Big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, J.P. Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on 
this channel, the main Transport Evolved channel. Plus, on a Sunday, you can see us over on Transport Evolved Take Two for our Sunday musing and our chicken and garden update. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon, and as always, keep evolving. Today for our classic Mac segment, we're back to our Power Mac G4, and this time I am actually running the classic Mac OS, AKA uh, OS 9.2, I think it's 9.2.1. It was the last version of the uh, the classic, as, as Apple used to call it, operating system, before Apple moved towards a, a Unix-based operating system, which is what it has today, OS X or OS 10, as it was called um, back in the day. This is a, a dual booting machine, so it can boot in native classic environment, but it can also boot into classic environment from within Mac OS, which was a big deal in the day. And it allowed you to run a lot of the old games that, that were pre OS X on your Power Mac. I spent many, many hours playing Marathon on OS 9. So I have very, very fond memories of that. And I figured I might as well get it out today. This this particular variant, you can tell, end of last century, beginning of this with the bubble motif, which I think first appeared in System 8.6, just before they changed the name of it to OS. I think that's when they switched it over. Anyway, if you are a classic Mac fan and you like the classic operating system, let me know what apps you still use today, because there aren't that many that work uh, certainly connected ones that so you can't use Internet Explorer or any of the other browsers unless you use FrogFind, which is a very excellent tool made by Sean uh, from um, Action Retro. Go check out his channel as well.